In my previous video, we took a look at my new TV, where I bought a 65 inch Hisense OLED TV for £799. And if you're interested in checking that out, I'll put a card on the screen. It's probably worth doing it quite quickly because they offer, the cashback offer is still on, so you can still get it for that price, but only for a few more days. But in that video, I mentioned that while it's a pretty good TV, there's a few limitations. One of which is using HDMI CEC control to use the TV's remote to control other devices. With my previous Sony TV, I used the remote to control things like my satellite box and AV receiver, and it was really good. I could use the TV's remote, change channel on the satellite, satellite receiver, switch inputs on the AV receiver, all that sort of stuff, and it all worked perfectly. Whereas with this new TV, over HDMI CEC, it doesn't pass half the buttons through. The only buttons it passes are the direction arrows, and like th I think like the play button and stuff like that, but none of the numbers or things like the guide button are passed over HDMI CEC. And that's really annoying because I really sort of grew used to actually just using the TV's remote and having one remote for everything. And then since using this new TV, everything else about it's been great, but it's constantly bugged me having a big pile of different remote controls and to swap between them. Especially because this high sense remote is such nice quality, it's a really nicely built remote with really nice buttons. Using the remote for the AV receiver or the satellite box just feels terrible because they're really cheap, not very nice remotes. So of course the logical solution is to look at universal remotes because that's what they're designed for. But I couldn't really find an option that worked for me. There's obviously a lot of cheaper sort of one for all type remotes but they all look a bit plasticky and I just know that if I got something like that it would never quite work. You end up pressing a button that's totally random for the feature that you don't that doesn't really make sense and they never quite match up exactly to what you want. And there's always a bit of a compromise there. And then on the higher end you got devices like the Logitech Harmony series where they're a bit more smart based, they've got apps, they've got external remote transmitters, all that sort of stuff. And then they come with a very nice remote control with a touch screen and stuff like that, or at least a sort of screen with a menu system on it. But it seems as though Logitech's actually discontinuing those. They're still available, but the prices have gone really, really high. So I suspect they're not making them anymore, but because it's such a popular product, the prices are skyrocketing for people wanting to buy them. And while I could probably get one, even if I got one second hand or something, I don't want to buy into an ecosystem that's dying out because all you'll do is end up with like losing software updates or the apps will stop working on phones and stuff like that. So what I really needed was a way to use the TV's included remote to control my other devices, including things like sending number buttons to the satellite receiver and being able to change inputs on my AV receiver. Now as I tend to do with a lot of my projects, I'm overcomplicating it a bit and building a very custom system, but I thought it'd be quite fun to take a look at how I'm doing it because this should be quite a powerful way of doing things. So what I've bought here is a cheap little Wi-Fi Tuya smart remote controller device. This is from Moe's, but it's, it's sold under loads of different brands. And what this is, is a little Wi-Fi based infrared remote transceiver. So it can receive remote signals and it can retransmit them. Now out of the box, this is one of those Tuya smart life type devices, which for lots of people work really well, but it's not the sort of thing I use. My sort of whole ethos when it comes to smart home stuff is that I want everything to be locally hosted, or at the very least, if there's a cloud service required for, say, remote control from away, being away from home, it has to still work without a working internet connection. It has to be very, you know, locally hosted. And this Tuya stuff is kind of the opposite of that. It all relies on their cloud system and you need the cloud for it to work. But the benefit of Tuya devices is that they're very cheap. This device here only costs about £17, £18. I'll put links to all this in the description. So, yep, I've bought a cheap Tuya smart device. And my plan here is to flash Tasmota onto this to run custom firmware on this so that instead of relying on the Tuya cloud, it'll work on my local network. And then what I'll do is I'll integrate it with Node-RED, which I use for my main home automation system. You could also use things like Home Assistant or whatever you prefer. So that what this will do is it'll receive remote control signals, pass that data to Node-RED running on my server. Node-RED will do, do all sorts of logic to translate the remote signals or to control devices that aren't even infrared based. If Node-RED wants to send an infrared signal to a different device, it will send a message to this, which will then retransmit it over infrared and control the device. And we won't go into a huge amount of detail of all like the tiny details of Node-RED setup, but I'll show what I've built and show it working. So yeah, I'm going to use this little Wi-Fi based infrared transceiver to run Tasmota and connect it into Node-RED. And then once all that's set up, what I'll be able to do is use this remote, press all the buttons, and if the button needs translated to control a different device, say I press a number for my satellite box, it'll send a signal to this, this will talk to Node-RED, Node-RED will translate it, send the translation back to this, and this will send the signal back to the satellite box. So, 
admittedly it's very overcomplicated and I'm relying on a whole wired home network, server, virtual machines, no dread, and many other things just for a remote control to work. But you know, I like to overcomplicate things. So let's take a look at the hardware. So this is the device here. Again, links in the description, these are only about 17, 18 pounds. And this is the Moe's name, but they're sold under lots of different names. I think this is like the Moe's UFO R6 or something. So that's it there. Super simple little device. You've literally just got a little plastic shell, which has a sort of obviously an infrared transparent sort of cover on the top. Plastic on the bottom. There's a button on the bottom, which I think will be for like Wi-Fi pairing or something. And a micro USB connection on the back. There's also a micro USB cable in the box to power it. And that's all you get there. Super simple, unbranded little device. However, when we take this apart, we're going to find there's a little problem. And that is historically, two of your smart life devices used chips that were compatible with the ESP8266. So you could very easily run custom firmware on them. Stuff like that mostly was just a case of taking the device apart, connecting onto the serial programming header, and flashing the firmware. In fact, you could even do it without that. You could even flash the firmware quite often over the network. There was like exploits people found in, in, in the two APIs. So you could literally run it on the network run a script that would then sort of in some way exploit the update process and flash Tasmosa without even having to take the device apart. However, unfortunately, times have changed and Tuya have started moving away from putting ESP8266 based devices into their, in, or chips into their products and are fitting different custom chips. I don't think they're really deliberately trying to lock people out because there's other ways they could do that with their previous chips. I suspect it's just a cost saving thing. They're fitting to chips in real tech and stuff like that. So out of the box, we can't flash Tasmota onto this hardware. Previous generations of this you could, and if you get lucky, you might find one that has an older chip and you can flash it out of the box. However, with this one, this is a newer model, it has one of those new chips in it. So what we'll also be doing in this video is we'll be transplanting the chip. Because while they're fitting new chips, they're still pin compatible with ESPs. So we'll be fitting in an ESP12, this is an ESP12S, soldering that into this to replace the existing chip and we'll be running Tasmosa on this new chip. So it'll be quite a fun project. And if this works well, I can see myself doing this to a lot of other Tuya devices because while it does require some soldering, it means you can get a very nice form factor with all the casing and all the electronics already done for you rather than trying to build something myself with my own circuit and building it into like a little project box. And the Tuya devices are super cheap and there's a huge range of them. So if you can simply replace a little chip with something like this that only costs a few pounds, and run Tasmota on it and have it fully locally controlled, it's pretty neat. So yeah, this is the ESP I've used. Again, I'll, put, I'll just put a link down for this. And this is the ESP12S. Now, in terms of the footprint, all the ESP12s will fit. However, the 12S has the benefit that it doesn't require any sort of additional hardware to get it to boot. Other ESP12 models require, I think it's like the enabled pin and the I think it's GPIO 15, I think. There's a couple of the pins that need to be pulled high and low to get, the, to get the chip to boot up and that would require a little bit of additional circuitry inside the device, which would be easy to do. But if you can get something like this, which is the ESP12S, this doesn't require that. This will just boot up directly. So you apply power to it, it'll start up. So these are a lot simpler. So if you're buying an ESP12 to put in something like this, look for the ESP12S because it doesn't require that additional, those additional pins to be pulled to um, start up. And of course I've now dropped it. but. Yep, that's the ESP12S we'll be putting in. And yep, these are just standard ESP8266 compatible chips, just in this sort of form factor that matches the form factor of the chip that's in here. All this information has come from the Black Adder wiki. There's a sort of wiki that documents all these two-year devices, and it explicitly states that these particular MOS devices have that new chip in them now, but they have also stated that it is it can be replaced with these ones. They also provide all the things like the templates for Tasmota, including all the pinouts for the GPIO and stuff like that. So it's a really useful resource. So yeah, let's get that out of the way and get the ESP out of the way. And here we have the device. So what we now need to do is get this open and take a look inside. Okay, so to get this device open, there's no visible screws, but essentially there's a few clips. So all you need to do is use a spudger. I use these metal ones. They're so much better than little plastic ones. And all you need to do is kind of get it in around the edge between sort of glossy plastic and this matte plastic and just bend the little clips out. It's a little bit fiddly because you've got to try and find where the clips are, but 
you will find them and you will be able to get them. I, I won't be able to really do this on camera because it is just so fizzly. I'm just going to end up destroying it if I try and force it on camera. But you can see there, I got one of the clips out there already. So it is possible to do. Essentially, there's two clips. There's a clip here and a clip here towards the back. Two sort of on the side towards the front and one straight at the front there. You'll maybe sort of mark the plastic a little bit, but once you've done it, you won't really... Like once you've got it sitting like that, you're not going to see it. So yeah, we'll get the top off this off camera and we'll come back and take a look inside. Okay, so that's the top now unclipped, so we can lift that off and see what's inside. So as you can see in here, it's a very nice layout. You've got a bunch of different IR emitter LEDs that point out in all directions, so it should be able to control devices all around it. And then you've got a single IR receiver on the front, so you've got the USB connection on the back, and then that's the front of the IR receiver. So that's what you'll want pointing towards your remote when you're sending a remote signal to it. And yeah, it's there. And this is held with three screws. So if we take these screws out, we'll flip the board over and see what we have on the other side. So take that out there, that out there, and this final screw down here. Like that, and then the board should just lift out the case, like that there. And now if we flip this over, you can see the components. So obviously we've got a bunch of components that don't really understand what they are, I'm not an electronics expert, but a bunch of different components, that's a little push button on the bottom, and your micro USB connector. And then up here, you'll see the main chip. Now this chip is one of those two year chips and it's a WB3S. So out of the box like this, we can't actually flash Tasmosa onto this. However, you'll notice that this looks very much like an ESP8266 and that's because it's designed to be pin compatible with one. In fact, for comparison, here's an ESP8266 or an ESP12 and that's it there. Apart from the pins on the bottom that this has that aren't actually connected, it is actually the same form factor and it's actually pin compatible. So that's the plan here. We're going to actually take this chip off this board and instead solder in an ESP8266 running Tasmota. And that will work. Because it's such a direct, you know, pin compatible sort of pin swap or chip swap, I can just take this chip out, put a new chip in, and that'll work. The only downside here is that I'll need to try and desolder this existing chip which is one of these sort of weird, like, PCB soldered to PCB with little notches outside. It's the same as an ESP. And to desolder that, you're generally meant to use, use a hot air gun. That's what they're, how they're designed to be soldered, which I don't have. So I'm going to go away off camera and try and desolder that with my soldering iron and just see if I can do it. I'm going to do that first of all because currently there's four hours left on Amazon for me to order a hot air station to arrive tomorrow. So I want to be able to see if I can desolder this with my soldering iron and if I can't, I want to have time to order that soldering station so it comes in time for tomorrow. But yeah, thankfully they've not soldered all the, pi all the pins on. There's just, I think, five on that side and then another five on this side. And the bottom ones aren't soldered, so that makes it a little bit easier. But yeah, I'll need to try and carefully desolder each of these and get that chip off without ripping off any pads. So I'll go away and try that off camera and see how I get on. And I'll come back and sort of talk about how I found it if I do manage to get it off. I won't try and film that sort of thing because it'll just be so fiddly, so yeah. I'll try and get that off and I'll come back and explain how it went. Okay, so I've successfully removed that chip, although I would definitely say if you're going to do this project, I strongly recommend a hot air station because I did actually damage a few of the pads. What I was kind of doing was basically putting the soldering iron on them and then sliding a metal spudger underneath just to try and break the solder. And it worked on most of them, but I think on this one here it was just a bit too forceful and I kind of scraped the pad off. We're just lucky that they're not actually essential, these pads that have damaged. But yeah, you can kind of do it if you're really careful, but, and I was kind of rushing, but I'd strongly recommend getting a hot air rework station. And if I'm going to do this project again, I'll definitely go and try and get one. But it's quite nice that I've been able to do it without having to spend 50 quid right now. But yeah, if you look at the pads I've ripped off, I've kind of got very lucky. So if we've got an ESP here, imagine obviously it sits like that. So we're flipping it over. The pad I've ripped off on this side is GPIO 15, which isn't used by Tasmota. And on this side, I've ripped off the pad that goes to reset and the pad that goes to enable. Now, the reset one doesn't even look like it's actually connected to anything. So I think that's just literally just structural, just to solder it down. And then the one that goes to enable is connected to something. But thankfully, because these are ESP12 S's, they don't need GPIO 15 or enable connected to boot. Other ESP12s do, they need one of them pulled high, one of them pulled low. Thankfully, this one doesn't. Although, if you did do this and you did have an ESP that required that, you'd still be okay because you'd always just stick wires onto the pins and just 
attach them to the appropriate thing because all you're doing is pulling them high or low. They don't need to go into the rest of the circuitry. But yeah, I've got very lucky with the pads that have ripped off there. So just, yeah, I would strongly recommend get a hot air station. But thankfully the pads that I do actually need, which are these ones here and these ones here, are all actually still intact, so that's fine. So what I need to do is flash the ESP. So what I've already done is I've gone away and I've taken one of the ESPs and I've soldered wires onto it to be, allow me to flash. So here we can see it here. And on the back you can see I've soldered wires onto VCC, ground, GPIO0, TX and RX. I'm going to use these to flash it. So obviously TX and RX transfer the serial data, VCC powers it, ground is obviously the ground, and then GPIO0 you need to pull to ground in order to put the chip into flashing mode, otherwise it just boots up normally. So I have this USB serial adapter that I've used before, and what's important is that you need one that's capable of 3.3 volts. In particular, I want to use one that has 3.3 volts on the logic lines as well, on the digital connections. I've said this before and some people have said, oh no, the ESPs are actually 5 volt tolerant on the serial lines as long as you're powering them over 3.3 volts, but I wouldn't, I'd rather not risk it. So this adapter here, you can switch between 5 volts and 3.3 volts, so that's really good. So I've set this to 3.3 volts, so I'm powering the adapter from the 3.3 volts here, so I'm feeding that to VCC, and then TX and RX are also 3.3 volts. There'll be much better videos on how to flash Tasmosa onto things, so I'm not going to try and go into too much detail and provide a sort of, you know, novice guide. But essentially all I've got here is VCC and Grounder connected to this, connected to the programmer. TX on the ESP is connected to RX on this. RX on the ESP is connected to TX on this, so you cross them over. And then to put it into programming mode, I just connected GPL0 to ground just by bodging this connection into here as well, and that connects it to ground. So what we can now do is plug this into a laptop, check it's recognised as, you know, and shows up, shows up in programming mode, and then we can flash Tasmosa. Okay, so I've now got my laptop here, and I've installed ESP tool on it, which is what I use to flash this. And then if we plug this adapter in with that um, GPIO zero shorted to ground, plug that in there, it'll turn on. And what should then happen is if it's all connected right, I can run this flash ID command, and it'll give me information about the ESP chip. There we go. So as you see, that's worked. So it has actually, it's correctly worked, and it's detected the ESP chip and it's giving me all the information, so 26 megahertz crystal, 4 megabyte flash, all that sort of stuff, so that's definitely worked, which is great. So what we're now ready to do is erase the flash, and then we can upload Tasmota. So that was the flash ID command, so now we run erase flash, and that will erase the ESP. There we go, let that run. I don't know if that's necessarily essential on a brand new ESP, but I think they maybe do come with some sort of firmware out of the box, some sort of stock stuff, so that's it raised. And now what we need to do is flash it, so there's obviously the command is here on the Tasmosa documentation, so we'll take that there. Um, don't we want to raise flash, we want to use write flash, and then we want to flash Tasmota. And I'm flashing Tasmota IR, which is a Tasmota build designed for IR blaster devices. I don't know why it's a specific build, I suspect it maybe just has a lot of IR code stored in it. So what they've done is they've maybe removed some other features so they can use the flash space to store IR codes. So I'm going to flash this one. So that's there, and in theory if we run this, it should flash. Or upload anyway. There we go, that's uploading. So yep, it's giving me a progress bar, and I can see that on the um, USB adapter there, the TX light's flashing, and then the RX light's occasionally blinking as the ESP responds, obviously with some sort of update as to how it's doing. So we'll let that finish flashing, and then hopefully I'll now have a ESP running Tasmota. But one thing that's definitely worth mentioning, if you're doing this a lot, rather than soldering wires like this and doing this sort of bodge, you can actually get relatively inexpensive test jigs, where basically you can slot an ESP directly into it on some sort of sprung-loaded pin, spring pins. They have the serial adapter already built in, so basically you slot your ESP onto it and plug it straight in over USB to flash it. It's basically this exact same setup, but on a single, really easy to sort of connect way. So that's definitely worth doing if you're doing it a lot because it saves all this soldering. You can just slot the ESP in and flash it. But yep, that's now flashed. So in theory what I can now do is disconnect the ground connection to the GPIO0 to let the chip boot up, plug it back into USB, and Tasmota should start up. Okay, so I've now disconnected GPIO0, so that's now not connected, and that wire's actually snapped off, so that was good timing. Um, but now if we plug this in, what should hopefully happen is Tasmota should boot up and we'll put see it on the laptop. This is the first time I've tried this, so plug it in there. And there we go. 
Yep, that output there is now coming from Tasmoto over serial. So, yep, Tasmoto started up. It should be broadcasting an SSID and I should be able to connect to it. So, there we go. That's Tasmoto now running on that ESP. So, what I can now do is desolder those wires and get that soldered onto the board. And yep, I've just been able to scan for Wi Fi on my phone, connect the Tasmoto access point, and pull out the web interface for it. So, yep, Tasmoto is definitely working. So, what I'll now do is I'll get all these wires desoldered, get that chip cleaned up, solder it onto this, then we'll come back. And I'm back, and I've now soldered that chip on. It was definitely a lot easier to solder it on than to desolder it, but now that's on there, that's not coming off again without you know, another, another fight. But yep, that's on there. But there's one more thing I need to do. Obviously because I flashed this ESP, I checked it on, it all worked fine. But then when I plugged this into my... I just plugged it into my PC over USB just to power it. And it didn't show up as a... On, like it didn't broadcast a Wi-Fi network. And the LED on it came permanently on. And I'm thinking, why has it done that? So I thought, oh god, I fried it. Couldn't work it out, couldn't get it working. So I then soldered some wires back onto the serial headers, plugged into a computer over the USB serial adapter to see what the serial debug console was doing, and it booted up fine. And I was like, what? So I, an LED wasn't lit at that point. So I played about with all the wires, and I found that if I ever disconnected the serial TX, I think it is on this, whatever the top one was, the... Um, yeah, the TX. If I disconnected the TX wire from this, from the USB serial adapter, it wouldn't work. But if I connected that to the connected TX to the serial adapter, it would start up fine. So I thought, that's weird. So I'm going around playing about with it all. Found that if I connected that TX to 3.3 volts on this, it would also start up fine. But if that wire was disconnected, it wouldn't work. So I'm, I couldn't work out why. But then I went back and actually looked at my footage to see the, what it looked like under this module. And what I found is, is that there was actually a trace coming away from those serial modules all the way down to here. And I've traced them out. And what they're actually doing is they're connecting the TX and RX on this through a resistor to the USB connector. Now, that's not a USB protocol, it's a UART, TTL serial port, but they're connecting it to the USB port on the back, presumably for like flashing it in the factory or something. So when I was plugging it into my PC, what it was doing is the PC's USB data lines were being connected through a resistor to the TX and RX on this chip and obviously causing it to lock up or fail or whatever it was doing. And then it must be when I was connecting it through into the serial adapter, that was obviously allowing the current to flow in a different way or something and bypass that issue, and it was working fine. So I thought, that's weird. So what I did to confirm that is I went and plugged this into a USB power supply, so something that doesn't have data lines, and it started up and broadcast an SSID absolutely fine. So as it is right now, I can plug this into a USB power supply and it'll work fine. But if I plug it into a computer or something with USB data lines, it won't start up, and that LED will come on solid. Now, I could just live with that, but where I'm going to be putting this, it's not unreasonable that I'll plug it into a device that's got data lines to power it. You know, I might plug it into my satellite box or my Mac Mini or something, just to power it, or even into my TV, you know, just to get power, because it doesn't need much. I don't necessarily want to need a dedicated power supply for it, or have to get a cable that isolates the data lines. But what I found is that if we look down here, if we get something to point with, um, down here, there's these two resistors. And it's those resistors that the data lines are sent through. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to get a soldering iron and just basically shove those two resistors off, just get rid of them. That will then disconnect the data lines from the USB port, and it should then power off of everything, off of a USB power supply or a USB port, whatever. So, yeah, that's just worth bearing in mind. It's interesting to see how that, whether that would cause an issue with the original chip. I don't think it would, because I'm pretty sure when I first tested this, just to check it powered up. I did just plug it into my laptop. Um, so I suspect maybe that these to your chips are tolerant to having whatever signals on those TX, TX and RX serial port pins, or maybe they're disabled on this. But yeah, when you put an ESP on it, it doesn't like being plugged into a USB port that's got data lines. So yeah, all I'll do is I'll just get the soldering iron, get rid of those two resistors, and then we should be fine. Okay, so that's those two little resistors removed. They're just basically not most soldering iron, so that was easy enough to do. And now it works fine. So now if I plug it into USB into a computer, it'll still start up as well, and it has motor launches, it connects to Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff. And so far I've configured it so it's now connecting to my local Wi-Fi network rather than broadcasting an SSID, and that works fine. So there's a bit more configuration I'll need to do on this, but what I'll do first of all is I'll get it put back into the enclosure just so it's, you know, all nice and safe, but that's on there, looks really neat. You'd barely be able to tell it'd been in doing that. I mean, you can obviously the solder's not as good as the original, but it's pretty neat. I'm really hoping with these sorts of devices that they continue to make 
the two your modules in the same form factor as ESPs and you don't start changing them because yeah eventually it could get to the point where you can't actually transplant the modules like that but for now we still can so that's really good. Module just hidden the corner there um, but I'm hoping that'll be fine I don't think that'll be an issue but yeah if we get that there get those screws in we can then put the module back together and then once that's done we can configure Transmota and hopefully have a working IR blaster running Tasmota. And then the fun starts for when it comes to configura configuration with the node red. But yeah, let's get these screws back in. Oh, drop a screw. Like that's not where that went. Get us all back together. And then we'll have a working IR blaster and a run running Tasmota. So that screw there. That screw there. Let me just get the top part, line the back up, because obviously it's got the back where the USB connector goes, like that, and then in theory, so I'll just clip that down. Yep, there we go. Good as new, but now with the replacement chip. So now we've taken out the two year chip, fitted in the ESP, and it's all back together. And this is why that even though this is a bit of a faff and you know you could just build your own sort of IR blaster just using an ESP and a couple of LEDs and stuff like that and it would probably be cheaper than buying one of these and then taking the module out of it. You just get such a nice form factor by doing this, these sort of transplants. You get all this original casing, the circuit boards, it's a really neat solution. It's much neater than something I could build myself. So yeah, that's it there. Now time to go and configure it. Okay, so now what we need to do is configure the IR receiver in Tasmota, set up a few things on Tasmota. And then we need to set everything up in Node-RED. Now, I'm not going to do a full tutorial on how to set this up, especially the Node-RED side, which I've already done. But I just wanted to do a quick overview of what I've set up. So the first thing you need to do is set up the Tasmota device, because currently I've just flashed Tasmota, but it doesn't know anything about the hardware. It doesn't know which GPIO pins are connected to the LEDs, which are connected to the IR receiver and all that sort of stuff. So for that, there's a template. So this is on that Black Adder wiki again. It's basically the place to find information about Tasmota devices. And as you can see, it provides this template, which is just a big JSON string. So what you need to do is you need to copy that. It also provides information about all the GPIOs, so you can see which GPIOs are connected to what. It also talks about how to replace the modules. This is where I saw the information saying to fit, fit an ESP12 type device. But yep, you need to copy that template. And then within the Tasmota interface, you go into configuration, configure other, and paste the template in here and activate it. I think the device then reboots. Once that's done, you can then go into configure module and you'll see the module type. I can't remember if this automatically set itself to Mose IR controller or I had to do it, but basically what that template has done is it's told it about the Mose IR controller. So I can pick that in there, save that configuration, and the device will now work correctly with the IR devices and all that sort of stuff. In here it also shows a bunch of other GPIOs. These are GPIO pins that are on the ESP module itself that aren't used. So what you could do is you could actually set these up and say, right, I want to use this as a button or this as an output or an LED and essentially wire them up yourself. You'd have to solder wires onto them internally, but wire up additional hardware inside the inside the module or inside the device to just really add additional functionality. And that would use these GPIO pins here. So yeah, you've got all that there. And then with once that with that all set up, it will now work. So if we go back to the main menu and go into the console, this shows all the IR commands it's received, and as you can see, it's just picking them up. It's pick up a lot of unknown ones, which are just, they randomly appear, I think it's just background noise. But if I take the TV remote and I press the button pointing at the device, it takes a little second, but there you go, that's a command from the TV remote. If I press back, give it a little second, and it comes up. Now, this looks like quite a long delay, but that's just a delay on the Tasmota web console. The buttons are actually sent to MQTT almost immediately. But you can see there, that's a TV remote, which interestingly shows up as NEC, even though it's a high-sense TV. Now my satellite receiver, interestingly, is also, it also shows up as NEC, so I press that there. That's a command from the satellite receiver, but it's basically the same thing. Just to show that it's not all NEC stuff, if I take my AV receiver's remote and press a button on that, you'll see that that shows up as Denon, so that shows up correctly. So, yeah, that works. Ignore all the unknown ones, those are just like random background noise, but yeah. The Denon AV receiver also shows up, which is good. 
Now, with these ones that say unknown, obviously this is just background noise, but I have found some remotes that also do that. For example, my Dyson fan, its remote isn't recognised by this, so if I turn the fan on, it'll send an unknown message, but it doesn't identify it with all the additional like bits and stuff like that. That means that without programming those codes in, which I think you can do, I wouldn't be able to transmit to that device. However, even when it's an unknown, me unknown message, it still provides a hash of the message. So you could still use that hash to match it. So you could still you read these buttons. You could still receive buttons on an unknown remote. You just can't transmit them without programming the codes in. But I don't I haven't looked into how you program codes in, but my remote all works. But that shows it's all working. And then here we have MQTT Explorer, and it works in here. So you can see it's under Tele for telemetry, Living Room IR, which is what I named the device. These are all my Tasmota devices. And sure enough, if I look at result here and I press a button, you'll see on the right hand side here, it will show the remote control codes coming in. And as you can see, this is a lot more responsive. I mean, you can't tell when I'm pressing the button, but that's happening almost instantaneously. So yeah, that works. Then transmit. All you would do is you transmit on a different thing here. So I think it's, I think, I can't remember exactly. I think it's CMND, LRIR, send IR or something. And you basically tr copy the code that's been received here into here and publish that, to that, pub publish to that topic and the device will then transmit the signal, and that works. So now we'll take a very quick look at my Node-RED setup. I won't go into a huge amount of detail because it's way over complicated. I'm probably the only person that can understand this because it's very much bodgy and a bit homebrew, but I can roughly talk you through it. So here we have a block for the incoming IR, and that's an MQTT block, so as you can see, it's listening on that topic, which is the same one we saw in MQTT Explorer. This then just produces JSON strings, so those big JSON strings of the IR with that represented the IR commands. Now while I could decode those and look at the individual parts of them, I'm just cheating, I'm just actually treating them as strings and just string matching the JSON. So in here we've got this, this JavaScript function called high sense mapping, and in here I'm mapping those big JSON strings that, yeah, I'm just string matching JSON, it, it works, um, even though it's not the best way to do it, but I'm mapping all those high sense IR commands to a sort of human readable name, so num1 to zero for all the number buttons, up, down, left, right, okay, play, pause, guide, etc. There's a lot of buttons I haven't programmed in, but I could just add additional ones in here if I needed them. I'm then also flipping the array around, so this is obviously IR codes keyed by the human readable name. I also just flip it around so I have um, human readable names keyed by IR, by IR codes. It's all very bodgy, but it works. So essentially with this function, I can either pass in an IR code, so this JSON string, and it will output the human readable name, or I can pass in a human readable name and it will output the IR code. So with this, even though I'm only doing it one way here, so I'm receiving the IR command and transmit and outputting a human readable name, I could actually do it the other way around, pass a human readable name into this function, get the IR code out, and transmit IR to the TV. So I've kind of just done it so it works both ways. So really all it does is it just tries to match it in one array or matches it in the other array, depending on whether it's a IR code it's producing or a human readable name it's producing, it outputs over it outputs over one of these two outputs. So you can connect onto this one if you're wanting to receive all the human readable names or onto this one if you want to receive the IR commands. And as you can see up here, the high sense mapping, I'm taking all the human readable names out. And on the satellite box, I'm receiving all the IR commands out and not the human readable names because I'm translating the other way. So similar down here for satellite box, it's basically the same thing. All we've got is the buttons on the satellite remote, so a few slightly different ones in here, and the IR commands for satellite. And then it's, in its simplest form, the IR commands come into here. This translates the TV remote commands into a human readable name. Those human readable names then pass through these functions here into the satellite mapping, which then translates from the human readable name back to the satellite's IR code, which is then sent over IR by publishing to that IR to that MQTT topic. There's then additional stuff here, so there's a limit block in here that just stops repeated commands because you could overload it if you sent too many, so that'll just limit up to four a second just if you're like holding a button down or something. A little bit, a little bit of translation in here, so this will translate some of these buttons. So for example, the channel list button on the high sense remote, I'm translating that to menu. So if I press the channel list button on the high sense remote, it will press the, it will trigger the menu on the satellite box. And then other things like this, the direction buttons, for example, the satellite box does work when I control it over IR, but because CEC does pass the direction buttons, 
I'm removing any direction buttons that are pressed in the high sense remote from the IR stuff. So the direction stuff on the satellite box is still done over CEC. So that's just done there. What I've also done with this is I've integrated my AV receiver. So this connects to my AV receiver over, over Telnet and receives all the status updates, including the receiver switching between different inputs, which is then stores in a variable. So if I look over here, we can see the variables that are stored. And it stores, for example, that the AVR is currently set to the satellite slash cable input. I then use this variable in this block here to match which input the receiver's on. So currently it's only set up for satellite slash cable, but I could add additional conditions into this and have additional outputs from this block. And that would let me translate differently depending on what it's on. So currently it's set to, this is for satellite slash cable. So if the receiver's on the satellite input, it will translate all the IR commands for the satellite receiver. If I had an additional device that I wanted to control, I would have an additional line coming out from a different connection on this, and it would, based on a different input the receiver is set to, and it would translate based on the other device. So if I've, say, got a Blu-ray player, for example, I'd have a different, a different mapping block for the Blu-ray player's remote, and if the AV receiver was set to the Blu-ray player, instead of the commands being sent through to the satellite mapping to translate them, they'd be sent through to the Blu-ray mapping. It's very hard to explain. This isn't really a tutorial. It's just to show roughly what I'm doing. But yeah, that's how that works. Additionally, I've got some buttons for my AV receiver. So I've got one button that'll toggle the receiver between different inputs. And I've got another button that if I hold it down, it will open the AV receiver setup menu. So for that, I'm treating it very similarly. I'm taking the human readable name coming out the high sense remote. So this is when the button's pressed in the high sense remote. In this case, I want the custom button on the high sense remote to be pressed. I then look at the various input stuff like that, and then I cycle the AV receiver's input. So I have a list of inputs that are on the receiver, and I cycle through these. So when I press the button once, it goes to AUX2, press it again, it goes to satellite slash cable, press it again, it goes back to AUX2. So it just cycles through this list of inputs, and I could add additional inputs onto here. But you'll notice that this doesn't actually connect down to an IR block. That's because my receiver has a network interface, so I can control it over Telnet. So instead of controlling the receiver by sending IR commands to it, what I do with these functions is this produces a, a telnet command. So this is SI, which is like switch input, and then the input. So for example, if I want to switch the receiver to aux2, this produces a string of SI aux2. That is then passed to the receiver over telnet, and the receiver will, will switch to that input. I just feel this is a bit more reliable than using IR because it's a network connection. It, it can't go wrong, whereas IR could potentially get lost or be interfered with. The final thing I've then got is this here where if I hold down the info button on the remote, it will turn on the AV receiver's menu. So what I do here is I've got a bunch of stuff here that basically looks for the same command being repeated five times because when you hold a button down, it repeats the command. A bit of additional logic in here to check that a button has been held down. If it's the info button, because you could add additional buttons in here for buttons being held, but if it's the info button that's held down, it will do this to enable the AV receiver's menu. And all that does is output the string MN men on, which is the AV receiver's command for opening the menu, and sends that string to the receiver over Telnet, and that'll open the menu. So yeah, that's no dread setup. Obviously, it's a little bit hard to explain. I mean, there's other logic in here, for example, where when the receiver's menu's opened, it stores whether the menu's opened in here. So you can see there's this variable here saying AVR menu on is off. If I open the receiver's menu off camera and refresh this, you'll see the AV receiver's menu is now on, that's set to true. And then I use this variable to basically, if the receiver's menu is open, I won't translate other remote control buttons because the remote control will now control the receiver over CEC. So I don't want any of these commands also being passed through to other devices. So yeah, there's additional stuff in there. But yeah, that's no dread setup. This isn't intended as a tutorial because this is so specialized and so specific to my exact setup. That if I showed you how to do this, it would be totally useless if your AV setup is even slightly different. And it requires quite a lot of prior knowledge of no dread. But what I'm trying to get across with this is basically how the setup roughly works and just the sheer power this has. You know, this whole system also has stuff about my lighting, my central heating, there's stuff in here all for that. So I could very easily link my TV remote and make it control my central heating. I could even go to the, just, I could just do ridiculous things. I could make it so that the buttons on my TV remote would type numbers into my alarm panel and set the alarm. Like you could do stupid things. So I can go, it's fully custom, fully flexible. So it's really pretty, quite cool. But yeah, that was probably a very long ramble about a sort of Node-RED setup that's very proprietary and doesn't really make much sense to anyone other than me. 
So now let's go and actually take a look at it working because that's really what people want to see is this setup actually working properly. So yeah, let's get the camera set up and take a look at it working. Okay, and that's how we're now installed. So I've got it inside my AV cabinet here. And all I've done is I've just put it on top of my satellite box and plugged into the USB port and it's the back of the satellite box for power because that's all it really needs. So that'll sit there like that. In terms of performance, even though it's in this cabinet, it still works perfectly fine. The metal cabinet doesn't stop the Wi-Fi signal, it still works okay. And in terms of transmitting its infrared signal, even though it's on top of the satellite box and the receiver on the satellite box is probably somewhere on the front, it's obviously powerful enough that it works fine, so it presumably just reflects, off, even, even though it's black, it probably just reflects off the inside of the cabinet enough just to get in, because it's got loads of LEDs in it, so surely that'll be fine. So the satellite box can easily receive the signal. And even though I'm not currently transmitting this from this to the TV, it can work. So I can make the send signals to the TV and it'll happily send a signal through the side of the cabinet, past the fan that's in the way, and into the TV's receiver, which is about here. So, yeah, definitely happy with the positioning in there. I don't need to put it anywhere else because I was kind of worried that it wouldn't work in this cabinet and I need to put it at the other side of the room so it's sort of got more line of sight to all the equipment, which would be perfectly doable because it is just a Wi-Fi device. It just needs a 5-volt USB port, but no, it works perfectly fine in this cabinet, so that's really good. So we'll leave that in there and take a look at it working. Okay, so now we're all set up. Now, before I demonstrate it, there was one little sort of curveball I found. And that was, I got it all set up and I sat in my office and I was pressing buttons on this remote and it was working fine. And I set up here, switched the TV on and pressed buttons and no remote signals were being received and I was a bit confused. What I hadn't realised is it turns out this is actually a, both an infrared and a Bluetooth remote control. And when it's connected to the TV over Bluetooth, which I think happens when the TV's turned on and turned out, like pulled out of standby, it no longer sends commands over IR. So that's a slight issue. Ultimately, all I've done is I've just disabled Bluetooth on the TV. You can just go into settings on the TV and under here, I think under system or something, or network it was, yeah, you can just turn off Bluetooth. You can also unpair the device from in here, but I kept finding it would just repair it over and over again. It would never actually stay, out, stay unpaired. So I've just turned off Bluetooth. And now the remote works over IR. When the remote was operating over Bluetooth, you get a little blue LED up here. But now Bluetooth's turned off on the TV, you'll see the LED is now red. And that's now sending out IR commands. So that's the one disadvantage to this because now the TV is also operating over IR, so it's maybe not quite as good in the sense you do actually need line of sight. It works fine though. The bigger issue, I suppose, is now that the TV doesn't have Bluetooth enabled. Personally, that doesn't bother me because I don't actually use any of the Bluetooth stuff on this TV. Realistically, all I can think of is it can work as a Bluetooth speaker, but my AV receiver can also receive Bluetooth audio. So I'm not really bothered about doing that. So for me, there's no real disadvantage to having Bluetooth turned off on the TV, and it means that the remote works over IR. But for you, if you are doing something like this, and you have this particular model of TV with this remote, and you do use the Bluetooth feature on the TV, you might need to think of something else. Potentially just getting a different remote control and just building it around a standard universal remote and not using this one. The only other big feature I think you will actually lose is the voice control. So with this setup, I can't use voice control. If I, if I press the microphone, it just says, please pair the Bluetooth remote control. Now, personally, I don't use the voice control. I'm Scottish, it doesn't work half the time. So it's not the end of the world, but if you do use a voice control, that is something you would lose by going down this approach. But for me, I'll gladly give up voice control to being able to, to be able to control everything else from this remote. Given my last TV had voice control, I think I used it maybe five times in the five years I had it. So yeah. Only thing you'll need to do is if you're using this particular remote and TV, you'll need to turn off Bluetooth on the TV and use the remote purely over IR. But now let's demonstrate it working. Okay, so now I'm gonna try and demonstrate it working. Now this will be a bit tricky to sort of show on camera because all you'll really see is an AV setup just working as you'd expect it to. But a lot of these features didn't work out of the box. So I'll try and explain which features or which things I'm doing that are being done by that IR receiver and the whole no dread setup. So one of the first issues I had with this is that my AV receiver would never switch to the correct input. So obviously right now I'm showing the smart menu from the TV. So this is the menu that's built into the TV with all the smart apps. And also if I went to live TV, it would be similar. My receiver is currently sitting on the TV audio input. So it's playing any sound produced by the TV that's sent to the receiver over, HD, over ARC, over HDMI ARC. That's fine, the receiver's on the TV audio input as you'd expect. However, if I now switch the TV onto the HDMI sort of input for the receiver, so this is now we wanted to get video from the receiver, the receiver, rightly enough, is sitting on the TV audio input. In fact, if I take the receiver's remote 
and I press the info button on it, stupid little left off camera here, you'll see if I press that, you can see the source is TV audio. And this was a big problem because I want to be able to switch the input on my receiver to different inputs, but I was having to take the, t the receiver's remote and press these buttons, and it's not a very nice remote, it's a big clunky thing. Now, on my old Sony TV, the, switching to the HDMI input would launch what's called the Smart Menu, which is a feature that Denon have. I can do it on this TV, but to do that, I have to go into Settings, or open the menu, go down to Settings, go into here, go down to System, go into here, go down to HDMI and CEC, go into here, go down to CEC Device Lists, into here, pick, H pick AV Receiver and press Device Root Menu. And that pulls up this. This is what my old TV used to give me as soon as I switched to the HDMI input. And from here I can pick all the sources, I can pick the inputs and it works perfectly, it's exactly what I would want. But I can't do that on this TV. Well, I can, but I'm not pressing that many buttons every time I want to change input on the receiver. So instead what I've done is I've used one of the programmable buttons on this remote. So on this TV there's this button down here, which is described as like the custom button I think they call it. And essentially it's a button that you can assign to any feature, any sort of input. You can make it switch to any input or launch an app. So what I've done here is I've programmed this to switch the TV to HDMI 2. So when I press this, the TV will switch to HDMI 2, which is the exact same as me going into the input menu and picking HDMI 2 from there. However, because this button has a unique infrared code, what I've done is I've set it up so that when I press this button, the TV will switch input as normal, but then the IR receiver will receive it, and that will send a message to my AV receiver over Telnet, so it'll switch my AV receiver to one of the inputs. In this case, by default, it'll switch to the Mac Mini input. So now when I press this button, what will happen is the TV will switch to HDMI 2, and then you'll see the receiver will switch to the Mac Mini input, and that's being done from the signal received by the Wi-Fi infrared adapter. So I press this, watch what happens. TV switches input, it waits a couple of seconds, there's a delay and no dread, and the receiver is now switched onto the Mac Mini input. Now when the TV is on the HDMI input, this button won't do anything to the TV, the TV will just sit as normal because it's already on the input, but the button will still transmit. So what I've now got set up is when I press this button, it will toggle between inputs. So if I press this now, it will switch the receiver to my satellite receiver input. If I press it again, it will switch back to the Mac Mini. Oh, I press the Netflix button. <laughs> ah, hate that button. So yeah, it's gone TV audio again, but that's fine if I press that. It'll switch to the Mac Mini input, or that satellite input, press it again, it goes back to the Mac Mini input, so you'll see the Mac Mini will come up in a second. There you go. Screensavers come on. But yeah, there's a Mac Mini. And there's a satellite box, which is currently not displaying anything, but if I open up the program guide, you'll see that satellite box there. So, satellite box, Mac Mini, satellite box, Mac Mini. I've currently only got two inputs set on this because I've only actually got two devices into the receiver, but I could easily add as many more buttons onto this as I wanted. It would just cycle through inputs. There's just an array in no dread that will just cycle through the inputs. So if I added more devices, I can add them all, but there was no point adding all the inputs because it just require a lot more button presses. But yeah, that's now in there. The other thing I've done is I've added a way to open the AV receiver setup menu because I just want to avoid having to use the AV receiver's remote as much as possible. So for that, I'm using the info button. Now on this TV, the info button just pulls up the sort of thing in the corner that talks about what input it's on and what signal modes and stuff are being sent in. And that times out after a while. So what I've set up is that if I hold down the info button, Nodred will realize I've held it down. It looks for consecutive remote commands, like the remote button being held down. It will then send a telnet signal to the receiver and that will launch the setup menu. So if I hold this down, you'll see the receiver setup menu will come up. There we go. So even though the TV does pull up its little info thing in the corner, that's fine, it times out. And now we're in the receiver setup menu. And because the TV does send the D-pad stuff over HDMI CEC, I can now control the receiver. I don't need to send these as remote signals or do anything fancy with these. These button presses just to navigate up, down, left, right. These are all done just through HDMI CEC. So the only thing my IR receiver is doing there is actually opening the menu. All these button presses now are just done over CEC. So it actually works really well. And if I go back out of that, it'll take me back to the Mac Mini. 
And then I've got a little bit of logic in Node-RED as well that I've explained before, that just when that menu is open, it won't then send any other button presses through or try and translate them because it knows the receiver is being treated over, being operated over CEC. But yeah, that's it working there. So that's probably the most basic thing there, we're just switching HDMI inputs. But the bigger bugbear I had was my satellite receiver. Because while I could use the D-pad and stuff to navigate around, I couldn't use the guide button to open the program guide, and I couldn't type in channel numbers, which was very annoying. But now, if we switch my satellite receiver, we'll do that. Again, using that little button there, very handy. We've got the satellite receiver up. Now, one thing you will see is there's no live TV showing. That's just because YouTube is so bad at content matching, even live TV shown on a TV like this, I've had issues before. So I've just disconnected the dish from the satellite box. So you won't see live TV, but you'll, we're talking about the remote control, not what's on TV. But yeah, so here's the satellite receiver. Nothing on the screen, there would be a live channel showing right now. But now, I can open the program guide. So if I press the guide button, the program guide opens. And what's happening there is that guide button is being received by the IR receiver. The mesh is going to Node-RED. It's translating it to the same to the remote control code from the guide button on the satellite receiver's remote, and it's transmitting that IR signal to the satellite box, and it's opening the program guide. Now that I'm in here, the direction pad stuff is just being done over CEC because that worked. So I felt that rather than trying to translate the, the direction stuff also as remote signals, which did work, I did set that up initially and it worked fine, I've decided just to leave these with CEC because it's a little bit more responsive. And this TV in particular has a really weird arrangement for play pause. You press this button here, it pulls up this little menu, and then you sort of do, the, you sort of then use the arrows to trigger different play pause, rewind, fast forward actions. Now that works fine over CEC with the receiver, which is good, but trying to do this over IR would be a pain because I'd have to kind of, in node red, build in the timeout that this is on the screen and then read which direction arrow's been pressed and send that appropriate remote code. So I've decided to leave the buttons that do work over CEC, working over CEC, so all the direction stuff and play pause is all done over CEC. But now the program guide button works. Additionally, there's I want to be able to pull up the setup menu on the, on the satellite box, which again doesn't work out the box, but now if I just use the channel list button, just because it was a spare button, press that, up pops the satellite receiver setup menu. So again, that's now something I've been able to implement. So that button is also working over IR. So that is translated, but the IR command is translated. So yep, I can now actually use my satellite box for once and do it properly, which is really good. And finally, the numbers also work, which is something that didn't work before. So now if I type in a channel number, so I can actually type, say, 101, that is all translated. The receiver is receiving that, Node-RED is translating it, and then it's retransmitting the IR signals to the satellite box. And yeah, it's throwing up errors, that's just because it's not got a dish connected to it. But yeah, that works there. I know it's not even got a dish. Go away. And then put a different channel number in, and it works. There's a little bit of latency there. You can tell it's not quite as responsive as using the original remote, but you're talking like a fraction of a second. It's, it's fine. Basically, you're typing a channel number, you just sort of, you know, purposefully type it in a little bit slower. You know, you go like, one, oh, oh that message is annoying. You go like, one, oh, four. You sort of do that. You don't just go bang, bang, bang. You just type it a little bit slower, and it works perfectly fine. So yeah, that's the sort of setup working there. And I am so happy with how well this works. And it's just so flexible. I can easily add in additional features. For example, right now, if I want to open the AV receiver setup menu, hold down info, right as before, and that will pull up the setup menu. And then now I've done that, this will hijack the direction pad that won't be sent through the satellite box. It just works brilliantly. So yeah, I'm extremely happy with how this has turned out. And of course here, there's a lot more flexibility. I could very easily add in a lot more different options into this. Obviously because it's now going through Node-RED, I don't even need to control other IR devices. This could talk to my lights and my lights could turn on and off. I could control my heating from this. I could literally control any part of my smart home from the TV's remote. And likewise, I'm not tied to this Hisense remote. If I wanted to use my AV receiver's remote, I can make the device receive commands from that. I could even just buy a cheap universal remote and use some of the buttons on that to control this device. I could buy a universal remote that's got buttons that are very specific to a particular task I want to do and use it. It's extremely flexible. 
But as it is right now, I'm just so happy that for about 20 odd pounds, I've been able to get my original TV's remote working and be, I'm able to control my entire AV setup to basically do everything I need to do on a daily basis from one remote. Sure, I might need the other remotes if I need a particularly special function. I mean, like the receiver's got all sorts of like, it's got functions like internet radio and switch on eco modes and stuff like that. But I don't use those that often, so I can, I'm happy enough to take this remote if I desperately need it for something. But for about 99% of the stuff I do, I can now use a TV's remote. And to be honest, after doing this, it probably works better than it did before. Because with the old Sony setup, it did work. I could do all the stuff I can do now from the AV receiver remote. From the, TV, from the Sony remote on my old TV, sorry. But some things like the satellite box, you couldn't open certain menus on it and stuff like that, and their buttons were a bit confusing because they weren't perfectly labelled. This actually just works so well. So, well, yes, the setup is super overcomplicated. You know, there's a whole server and network and virtual machines and two network switches and a lot of stuff in between the remote control, sending a button here and then it coming back out to the device. It works really well. So yeah, there you go. That was my sort of homemade IR translator setup, I suppose you could call it, using a cheap Moe's Smart Home Smart Life Tuya IR transceiver, sticking an ESP8266 module in it, flashing Tasmota, linking it to Node-RED, and it all works. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for watching. Obviously, if you're interested in trying this, it's quite an advanced project. You do kind of need to understand things like Tasmota and Node-RED and actually understand the sort of underlying thing there. And you'd probably want to already have a setup. I wouldn't go setting up Node-RED just for something like this, as like, if that's the only thing you're doing. But if you wanted to try something like this, or you want to integrate infrared remote control stuff into your smart home environment, this is a particularly neat way of doing it. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying the hardware I've used here, there's links in the description.